We're somebody different than we used to be. And there's a joy, there's a wonderful excitement about that. And Paul says, Bless, praise God who's blessed us with all spiritual blessings in heavenly places. I've got to say one thing about that before we move on, and we are going to move on. Blessed be God, praise God, who's blessed us. That's the grace way. The grace way says, he blessed me, he blessed us. Look at what I've received from him. How can I do less than love him? You see, the grace way is that, is that he blesses us, and we bless him in response. We praise him. We don't praise him to get his approval. We don't bless him to get him to take notice of us. We see the great things he's done for us. Grace, all that God is free to do for you through the finished work of Jesus Christ. When you run the race and fail, he didn't. I'll tell you that verse in Romans 5, through the disobedience of one, I know that guy, <laughs> but it was through the obedience of one, many are made righteous. Not my obedience, but his. Now what does that do? <laughs> when I see his blessings upon me, does that mean I just, you know the idea is, you teach that to people and they'll just go out and live in sin. I was doing that already. Was pretty good at it, by the way. His grace came and changed all that took away my sin and gave me life. It doesn't make for careless living. It doesn't make for passivity. Self does that. That's the self life. The grace life is Christ in you, Him becoming your life, and it's, all, and it's something exciting. Now, I want to go through the rest of the verse. Blessed be the God and Father of our Lord Jesus Christ, who hath blessed us, with all spiritual blessings in heavenly places in Christ. I've struggled about how to teach that verse. And I thought, well, why don't you just teach it the way it comes? What an idea. <laughs> all the homiletical books would go out of business if people did that, wouldn't they? Who hath blessed us with all spiritual blessings in heavenly places in Christ. Notice the character and the extent of our blessings. All spiritual blessings. First notice their, the character. They're spiritual. Now, it, that, that at once brings you into two different emphasis. And by the way, when you hear Bible teachers and read commentaries, they, they, it, for some reason they pick one or the other of these, and, and, and I'm, I'm reading them, so duh, it's not one or the other, it's both. Because when it says it's spiritual, one, he's talking about the region in which our blessings reside. They are spiritual blessings. If you look over at chapter 3, verse number 16, you'll get the emphasis here. Chapter 3, verse 16. Paul's praying for the, Philippians, uh, the Ephesians. That, he would, that God would grant you according to the riches of his glory to be strengthened with might by his spirit, where? In the inner man. You see, the, the region, the realm in which our blessings reside is in our inner man. That's where they're called spiritual blessings. They don't reside in our flesh, and our self-life. They reside in who God has made, this new creature God has made us in Christ. They're, they're in, this is an inner man operation. But it also talks about the medium by which they're conferred upon you. Because they are spiritual. That is, they are imparted to you by the Holy Spirit. Notice the verse again, 3.16. We're strengthened with might, how? By His Spirit. Not by the preacher. Not by the priest. Not by your activity but by the working of God the Holy Ghost in your inner man. You see, these blessings that we have are not the outer things. They're the inner things. If, if, hold your hand and come over to Colossians chapter 2. When you talk about religion, one of the great places to go in your thinking 
to keep it properly adjusted is Colossians 2. Because in Colossians 2 verse 10, you have the counterpart, the sister verse. You know, Colossians and Ephesians are sister epistles. There are dozens and dozens of places in Ephesians and Colossians that are almost mirror images of one another. It's crazy. It's crazy like wonderful crazy, not crazy like dumb, okay? It's, it's wonderful. I, I, I've, I've, sat, I've spent exciting hours. I, you could do this. Instead of sitting around wondering what to do with yourself tomorrow afternoon, take Ephesians and read it six or eight times, then take Colossians and read it six or eight times, and then go back and start reading Ephesians and start noticing the places you remember that were in Colossians. And you know what? You'll fill up a piece of notebook paper. And by the way, it'll be better for you than anything you watched on TV or read in the newspaper or did at the gym or on the ball field. I wouldn't say work because you've got to go to work, but all that other... You know what it'll do? It'll begin to transform the way you think about some of these things. Well, a sister verse to Ephesians 1.3 is Colossians 2.10. And ye are complete in him. That's the Lord Jesus Christ. Look how complete he was, or is, verse 9. For in him dwells all the fullness of the Godhead bodily. Everything God is is in him. <laughs> bodily. That is available for you and me. Because he's not just the God who lives away out yonder. He's also the man, Christ Jesus. He takes God by the one hand because he's God. He takes man by the hand because he's man and brings us together. And he's the mediator, the go-between, the daysman, the place of meeting between God and man. It's a wonderful thing. That's an exciting thing. And you're complete in him. How could you be any completer than being complete in the one who is God? Fully God, truly God, undiminished deity, and yet fully and completely and totally man. Tempted in all points like you are, yet without sin. He ran your race successfully when you didn't. That's a wonderful thing. And you're complete in him. There's nothing, you know, we want to be complete. We want to be fulfilled. There's nothing. There's nowhere to be fulfilled completely, totally, with no gaps, like in him. Now, verse 11. In whom? Also, when Paul says these things, he begins to tell you about some of them. In whom also you're circumcised with the circumcision, notice, made without hands. That means no human did it. Well, if a human didn't do it and it was done, who did it? Verse, verse uh 12, buried with him by baptism, wherein also you're risen with him through faith of the, there it is, operation of God, who hath raised us from the dead. Now notice, circumcision and baptism, those are two of the great religious rites. Neither one of them, both of which you have today, by the way, but neither one of them have anything to do with what a preacher did to you or have anything to do with your outer man. There's a circumcision made without hands. Well, there's a circumcision in the Bible in the flesh made with hands, Ephesians 2.12. That's Israel's program. You and I have a circumcision that sets us apart from our old man, had nothing to do with anything anybody, God did it for you. You see, these are all spiritual blessings. These are things that, are, that, that reside in your inner man and that are imparted to you by the operation of God himself. This isn't something you have to achieve or that you could achieve if you had to. Ephesians 1.3. So he's blessed you with all spiritual blessings. You're in Ephesians 1. Go back to Galatians chapter 3 just for a second. Here, here's a verse and I want you to get a hold of here. He's blessed us with all spiritual blessings. All these blessings in our inner man that the Spirit of God is going to produce. We're strengthened by His Spirit. There's the medium. In our inner man. That's the place of His operating and working in me. Galatians 3 verse 3. Are you so foolish? Now, he says that because people get confused about this because instead of just listening to what God says, verse 1, O foolish Galatians, who hath bewitched you that you should not obey the truth. Somebody comes along and tries to cast a religious spell on you and think it isn't enough just to have this 
non-physical thing happen to me that I didn't even sense and feel. You know the old saying, a man with an experience is more powerful than a man with a, with a testimony or, or with, a, with, with a doctrine. That's why when they try to sell you something, one of the most powerful things in sales are testimonials. In fact, I saw recently we saw uh, some uh, some I was looking at some software, computer software on the internet for sale, trying to find some stuff to do some work with. And one of the complaints, this is a new package just put out, and one of the complaints that was laid against it is there were no testimonials. <laughs> and I'm thinking, well, the guy could go to Fiverr and you know for five bucks get thirty people to write him a testimonial. That, well, what's the test? I don't believe the testimonials anyway. Do you? You do. Well, I don't. <laughs> I'm thinking, you know, if I was the guy, I'd, I'd get some friends to write me some testimonials. That's what the, you know, anyway. Experience is more powerful than just the sales presentation. What is that way in religion? You know how many people, the way in First Timothy 4 when he says that, some, that, that the Spirit speaks expressly in the latter time, some shall depart from the faith. How? giving heed to seducing spirits and doctrines of devils. And what do the seducing spirits do? A seducer is someone who draws you away from what's right with the promise of some physical ecstasy, some physical delight, some experience. And if I can point you to experience-based reality, I can draw you away from doctrinal-based reality. But where does the spirit work? What kind of blessings are there? They're spiritual blessings. They're not operating in your emotions. They're not operating in your outer man. They're operating in your inner man. Now, if they operate in your inner man, they can work out through your body. But they don't work out through your body because that's where they come from. That is a result. And whether that result happens or not, the reality is what the Spirit of God's doing in your inner man. Oh, foolish Galatians, they'd been bewitched by getting people to make them look at the flesh, their physical activity, and trust what they physically could perform. So he, he corrects them, verse 3. And the way he corrects them is ask them questions. Paul was trying always to get you to think. Not just in, you know, lecture you, but get you to think. Think about what you know about who you are in Christ. Oh, foolish Galatians. Verse 3, are you so foolish? Having, now no, under, circle that next word, will you? Begun in the Spirit. Are you now made perfect by the flesh? If you began the Christian life in the Spirit, what do you think your flesh is going to add to the perfection that God provided? Now, if you keep that in mind, you can get over the hump of religion you can get over the hump of performance-based acceptance ideology, the idea that if I do these things, God will be happier with me, and if I do, to do this, God will bless me, and if I don't, he'll withhold. You can get over that. What I want you to see is that word, begun. Where does the Christian life begin? Having begun, say it, in the Spirit. The Christian life begins with you being blessed that instant with all spiritual blessings. You follow that? Man, that's good. <laughs> this is not something you achieve. This is where you start in the Christian life. You start at the top of the ladder. You're not at the bottom with, with ten rungs to climb. Every other blessing you have. And you do have a lot. Every other blessing you have is earthly, outside of you. All the earthly blessings are outside of your inner man. The things out there, they're not in here. The things out there, heaven and earth does what? Passes away. They also vary. Look around. And there are all kinds of people in a room like this. Some can sing, some can't. You know, Rick can, this Rick can't. <laughs> some can be bright with math, some can't. You're a unique individual. 
created with short. First Corinthians chapter 4, Paul asked Corinthians, what do you have that you didn't receive? You've got talent, you've got some ability. Don't strut around like it was your doing. You received it. So the, ble the, the outward blessings, they vary. The spiritual blessings that you have, they don't vary. You see, he said all spiritual blessings. That's the extent. There, there's no limit. When he says all, he sweeps away any variation. You know how many blessings you've got? You've got as many as I do. You know how many I've got? I've got as many as you do. God is as rich to you in Jesus Christ as he is to me. He's as rich to me as he is to you. I love that. We're complete in him. Come with me to 2 Corinthians chapter. And by the way, we're complete in him, and that's the way our Christian life began. Please get that. 2 Corinthians 9. You began with a full tank. You began your Christian li life with everything on board that God has for you. Complete. 2 Corinthians 9 verse 8. And God is able to make all grace abound toward you. That ye always, here it is, having all sufficiency in all things. May abound every good work. I love that word sufficiency. It's another way of saying complete. It's another way of saying all spiritual blessings. God's grace makes you sufficient. Chapter 3, verse 5 of 2 Corinthians, he said, our sufficiency is of God. 2 Corinthians 12, verse 9, he tells him, he says, my grace is sufficient. That word sufficient means able to stand lacking nothing. Able to stand requiring no aid, no crutches, no help. I'm just able to stand there. And I'm sufficient. I'm totally and completely equipped for that moment. All spiritual blessings. You hear sometimes people say that uh, there are 36 things that happen to a believer the moment he trusts Christ. That comes from a list out of a, a book of theology written by Louis Perry Schaefer back in the earlier part of the last century. He, his systematic theology, uh, uh, theology book, I forget the name of it, um, had, had these things listed. I remember as a young believer reading that and getting all excited about it. And I started compiling my own list. And a few years ago, when we, after we'd moved up here a little while, uh, I was talking to a young man, and, and he was at my home, and, and, he, and he was, we were talking about it. And he says, I make a list. I said, yeah, I got me a list, too. I, I had grown the list from 36 to about 58. <laughs> and we were talking about it one time in one of our, 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 our school meetings, and, and one of the guys went home and down to Florida, and he came back next year. He says, Brother Rick, I got 101. <laughs> and I said, wow, you know. And, and I looked at him, and, and you, can, you can divide them up. They're, they're, so, they're, they're, they're so manifold. You can divide one into five, or you can combine five into one. You know, you can See, the number isn't the issue. It's just that it's, it's all. It's everything you're ever going to need. It's complete and total. All spiritual blessings. If you look there in Ephesians chapter 1, you see the all, and you see the sufficiency of them. We've already looked at these verses a couple of weeks ago, and we kind of... Uh, peruse through these verses. Verse number 4. According as he hath chosen us in him before the foundation of the world that we should be. You know, people, people struggle for purpose and meaning. They, per they, they struggle for a reason. Why am I here? What do I exist for? What can, what can I do with my life to have some impact and some meaning and he says, you know what? In Christ, you're chosen in Him before the foundation of the world. When we study that, I'm going to, call, I'm going to preach a message. I, I, like to, I call it prehistoric creatures on display. <laughs> there you are. <laughs> but look what He chose you for. You see how He says that? That we should be. Just stop right there. Be. He chose you to be somebody. He chose you to have an identity. 
See, when you be, that, that verb to be means a, a per, a, your, your state of being, your identity. You want purpose and meaning. God has made you a new creature in Christ. When God went back and made Adam, he created something new in the universe. A mud man, Brother Alex calls him. Threw dirt in the devil's face. I like that. <laughs> but he was new. And he had a purpose and a plan for man in his creation. And man fell. And God, through the Lord Jesus Christ, came and has restored the purpose. If you want to find out what God... Listen, you're a unique person. But God created man for a reason. And if you want to find out the purpose that you play in that, it's in the book, and you go back... And you find out before the foundation of the world, he had a plan and a purpose. Now you talk about, you want some meaning and purpose in life. Woo-hoo! Go find out what God's doing. People want to be secure. So he says, having predestinated us to the adoption of children by Jesus Christ and himself, God has taken and predetermined the destiny of believers. Conversation yesterday. At my home, someone brought up, uh, well, well, what if the world ends? And, I mean, they blow us up. Ignite those nukes that they say they got out there and all that stuff. Stacy said to him, says, well, the Bible says the rapture is going to come before the tribulation. The Lord's coming. And you begin to lay out what the Bible says. And you know what? All of a sudden... Nuclear war doesn't seem quite as pressing in it. It's not that it's not an issue. It's a, it doesn't seem quite as... Th Why? I've got some security. I told you when we moved to Chicago back in 79, people down in Alabama said, you don't move to Chicago. <laughs> what? Are you nuts? You leave the beautiful Alabama to go up in that dangerous place? I said, what do you mean? He said, don't you know that the Russians have nuclear warheads aimed at Chicago? And that within 20 minutes, they could blow the whole town. You wouldn't have time to even get in your car to get out of town, much less get out of town. Within 20 minutes, they could blow you to kingdom. I said, Bobby, where are they going to blow me? To glory. <laughs> Where's the red phone? Call them, say, shoot. <laughs> but you see, that's a different attitude. There's a security in that that can get you out of being afraid of losing the turmoil of fear of, of not having something. And I, I have to, the panic of trying to hold on to things that I'm going to lose anyway. People feel alienated, alone. No one cares. I was sitting in a fast food restaurant. Recently, and a young guy came in, he, and he had the sides of his head shaved, and he had a, looked like a rooster hairdo, <laughs> stuck all up about this high, and it was dyed red on the bottom and black on the middle and orange on the top. And he sits over there, and he reaches down to eat, and, and I thought he was going to tip over in the thing. <laughs> the, the, and I'm looking at it, and I said to my grandson, I said, see that? He's a teeny bit conspicuous, isn't he? And I walked over and I sat down at the table next to the young gun. I says, I, I, I see the hairdo. What, whatever made you decide to, to put the colors in that, in that row? And he got a little peeved at me for talking to him about it. Now look, if you go out and paint yourself green and put sprinkles all over yourself, I'm assuming you want a little attention. When somebody gives you the attention, what's the big deal? Now that's an extreme example of what we do in trying to fit in. But people are driven by that. So verse 6, he says, you know what? He's made me accepted. If you're accepted, you're acceptable. I can relax. It's okay. Where? In the beloved. Not in me. In him. People feel trapped. 
one of the great emotional traumas of our day, depression, that trapped feeling. He says, in whom we have redemption. Are you getting the idea here? These blessings make you sufficient for everything you go through. They're complete. They're sufficient. In 2 Corinthians 5, verse 14, he says, the love of Christ, what? Constrains us. The love of Christ reaches out arms of everlasting love and puts them around you and picks you up and walks off across the, the deck of the journey of life and carries you along. It's his love for you. Do you understand today that you live in the embrace of God's amazing grace? And he's got you and never let you go. <laughs> That's wonderful. Paul said, it's the goodness of God that leads you to repentance. That's it. Well, we've got to move on. I could stay right there. <laughs> I like this. But he says, he's blessed us with all spiritual blessings. You see the verb, he hath blessed. It's already yours. The one specific moment in which the transaction was completed, has already been accomplished. That means as a believer, I have the present reality, not the future prospect, not the hope one day, but the present reality of my actual identity being blessed with all spiritual blessings. They say, well, when was that moment? Well, verse 4, he says it was before the foundation of the world, in the in the in the." Et eternal mind of God himself. This thing had its origin. You go down to verse 9, he talks about this mystery of his will that he purposed, the good pleasure which he purposed in himself before the world began. Chapter 3, verse 11, he talks about we're a part of an eternal purpose that he had in Christ Jesus. So in the mind of God, this has been on his mind and heart all along. Verse 7, it says, in whom we have redemption. In history, it moved into the reality of history when Jesus Christ went to Calvary. And when he went to Calvary and died for your sins and my sins, was delivered up for offenses, and then he was raised again as the receipt that said, paid in full. I said on the radio this morning, there's no religion in the world. Islam, Buddhism, Taoism... Confucianism, Rosicrucianism, Judaism, like Christianity. Because none of them are built at the door of an empty tomb. They all stand on the coffin lid of their founders. And Jesus Christ is not as others. Just the echo from the bygone past speaking across the ages. He's the ever-living everlasting Savior. And that means his death at Calvary is a complete payment where he completely, totally put away sin. Had there been one sin left, death would have held him. Whoa. And it's by his cross we're reconciled to God. But you know it can be in the mind of God in the eternity past, it can be a historic reality in the death of Christ and his resurrection, but it also needs to become a personal possession for you. Drop down to verse 13. In whom you also trusted, after that you heard the word of truth, the gospel of your salvation. I want you to notice the sequence in this verse. Because Paul's being very clear and very careful so that you have no question about the salvation issue, and the bestowing, the conveying of these all spiritual blessings by the Spirit of God into your inner man. They come because you trust Christ. But you don't trust Christ because you just decided it was a good idea, or you went down to church and did some rites and some rituals. 
in whom you also trusted, after that you heard the word of truth, the gospel of your salvation. Faith comes by hearing, hearing by the word of God. Romans 10, he asks about Israel. He says, Whosoever shall call upon the name of the Lord shall be saved, but how should they call upon him in whom they've not heard? And how should they hear except somebody preach? And how can they preach except someone be sent? There is a process. And it's when you hear the truth that Jesus Christ died for your sins, was buried and raised again the third day, and that when you just rely exclusively upon what he's done, not what you do, but what he did. Not who you are, but who he is. Your faith resting in him results in God taking massive action in your behalf. In whom also you, you also trusted after that you heard the word. Faith comes by hearing, hearing by the word of God. In whom also after you believed, you were sealed with that Holy Spirit of promise. <laughs> Here comes the Holy Spirit. The moment you believe, God the Holy Spirit rushes in. The sealing is the last thing he does. There are five things we talk about it that he does the instant that you trust Christ. One, he circumcises you. He crucifies you with Christ. Two, he regenerates you. He gives you resurrection life. Three, he indwells you. He comes to live as the living person of the Godhead to indwell you and live with your inner man. He baptizes you into the body of Christ, gives you this new identity, and then he seals you in all of that so that it can never change. That spells crib, C-R-I-B-S. That's what you do for a new baby. You put him in a crib. <laughs> And you're put into that eternal, uh, that, 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 that divine, encapsulized environment of the sealing of God the Holy Spirit. And you're kept there by Him. So you, 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 you're blessed. When? Well, the blessing started in the mind of God, became a reality at the cross work of Christ, but it became yours the moment you trusted Him. December 31st, 1962, 50 years ago almost this year. I know I don't look like I'm 50. I look more like 33 with Benny over there. The older I get, the, the more my spiritual birthday is what I count. About 10 minutes after 8 o'clock on that Saturday afternoon, that Saturday evening, sitting on an organ bench, waiting for a church service to start, watch night service. I trusted Jesus Christ as my Savior. And that instant, all this became mine. That's when it happens. Have you ever personally had that experience of salvation? It's not something you grow into. It's something that happens in an instant. Because you've made the personal choice to pass from death to life by relying exclusively on Jesus Christ. I'd been in church all my life. I was raised in church. My mom and dad believed that the doors were open. There was a reason for us to be there. And we were there on time and ahead of time. I was there that night sitting on the organ bench. I was 14 years old. I was sitting on the organ bench. I was uh, 15 years old. I was sitting on the organ bench because I was going to play the organ for the meeting that night. I was sitting there practicing. And I was on my way to hell. But that night it all changed. And it had nothing to do with what I did. It had nothing to do with what I didn't do. It had to do with me doing something that wasn't... That, that the, only, the only response grace will accept is faith. Because faith is the only thing you can do without doing anything. Because it's simply relying on what someone else did for you. If you look over at 1 Corinthians chapter 1, you'll see it. People say, Brother Jordan, I don't know if I'm one of the elect or not. Well, let me show you how you can know. 1 Corinthians one twenty one. For after that in the wisdom of God, the world by wisdom knew not God. You'll never come to God in the wisdom of the world. The world's wisdom tells you, you know, if you could just measure up. People that profess not to believe in God still want to measure up. I had a guy not long ago, he's an atheist, professed to be an atheist. 
arguing with me about having to keep the commandments. And I said, wait a minute, you don't even believe them. <laughs> you know, she said, billboard, what is it about not, you don't understand, God. <laughs> I said, you don't believe that. You don't believe the God part. And you're telling me i got to do something to make a God you don't believe in? He said, well, but if there is one, you'd have to... I said, you know what your problem is? You're trying to be your own God. You conjure up God of your own making. For after that, in the wisdom of God, the world by wisdom knew not God. It was God's genius not to let your genius find him. Or you'd always brag about you found him. I found the Lord. Well, I know he's lost. <laughs> he wasn't. You were the lost one. And he found you. It pleased God. Now watch. Here's the pleasure of God. It pleased God by the foolishness of preaching to save them that believe. You know what the sovereign free will and pleasure of Almighty God is? You know what, before the foundation of the world, God chose to do when he purposed in himself what he was going to do? That verse said, he purposed to save them that believe. So after you hear the gospel and you believe the gospel, what happens? 1 Corinthians 12, 13, for by one spirit are we all baptized into one body and you put into Jesus Christ. I hope you get that. There's nothing that lies before you to do. There's nothing that remains behind you that needs to be fixed. There's nothing that's required of us but simply to possess the possessions that God has already given to us. Ahab went to Jehoshaphat back in 1 Kings and he says, Don't you know that Ramoth Gilead is ours? We but have to take it. <laughs> and I think, how, much, how Christians are like that? Don't you know, most of them don't know, that all spiritual blessings are ours. Learn it, listen to it, hear it. In Christ, they're all ours. All we have to do is to get up and take it. All there is for the believer, all the Christian life is from start to finish after you've trusted Christ. You began in the Spirit. You began with the all spiritual blessings. You began as the present reality. This is who you are. Now what? Now just go possess your possessions. Now go take them up. Lay hold on eternal life. Go be all that God made you to be in His Son. Now He says they're blessed with all spiritual blessings in heavenly places. That's the realm, the location, the region of our ministry and our impact. We're going to have some fun with that one. Come with me to Colossians chapter 3. I'm just going to move on from that one this morning because we're going to spend, we get down in verse number 9 and 10 in Ephesians 1 and we're going to spend some time studying uh, the geography of where we're going to, you know, of what the heavenly places are like, and you'll, you'll, it's fascinating, wonderfully exciting information. What I want you to see this morning is that that's just the place of our, of our, our the, where our blessings reside. If that's where my blessings are, and I, and all I need to do is appropriate them, by faith bring them into the reality of my experience. Where do I need to abide? Well, if I abide in my mind thinking down here, are my blessings here? Where are my blessings? They're in the heavens. So where do I need to go? Well, Colossians 3, If ye then be risen with Christ, seek those things which are where? Above. above. What's above? All my spiritual blessings. Where Christ sitteth on the right hand of God. Ephesians 1 says that's the heavenly places. Set your affection on things above, not on things on the earth. For you're dead, and your life is hid with Christ in God. I read that and I say, boy, that's somebody. That's who I be right now. 
You know what the present reality of my location is? I'm hid with Christ. Where? In God. I take my heart and I just go travel up to the headwaters where I'm in Christ. And that's where my thinking, my heart, the focus of my life needs to be. Blessed with all spiritual blessings in heavenly places in Christ Jesus. That's the one person in whom all the blessings are enshrined in him. All of our treasures in one place, in one person. You can't separate between him and the gifts, the blessings, because he is the gift. One last verse, Romans chapter 8. You're supposed to be happy on Easter. You're supposed to be a happy time. And I don't think anything could be any happier than Ephesians 1.3 <laughs> in the heart of a believer. Romans 8, verse 32. He that spared not his own son, but delivered him up for us all, how shall he not with him also freely give us what? All things. He gives you all things so much so that if you go back to verse number 11, Romans 8, 11, but if the spirit of him that raised Jesus from the dead dwell in you. Look at that. Verse 10. I'll start in verse 9. For ye are not in the flesh, but in the spirit. If so be that the spirit of God dwell in you. Now, if any man have not the Spirit of Christ, who is God, you see how God dwells in you? It's because Christ dwells in you. But how does Christ dwell in you? He takes the Spirit, and by virtue of the person of the Holy Spirit living in you, Christ is there. And God is there. And it's the Spirit of Christ Himself that's there. He's just making it clear, making sure you understand that everything's in Him, that He's the center of it all. And when you go through Ephesians, that little expression, in Christ, is the key to everything. And it starts out with the verse that tells you the only way to get the blessings is to be in Him. I'm crucified, Paul said, with Christ. Nevertheless, I live. Yet not I. But Christ lives in me. And the life that I now live in the flesh, I live by the faith of the Son of God who loved me and gave himself for me. It's the Christ life that lives in me, that takes my life and allows my life to be all he designed it to be because it's his life making my life the life God gave me and meant me to be. And I say, whoa, I'm blessed with all spiritual blessings. Don't, don't tell me to look toward my emotions. I can't trust them. Don't tell me to look toward my intellect. It fails too often. Don't tell me to look at my strength, my resources. I'm going to look yonder to him and focus on what he's done and is doing. You can't have Christ's blessings unless you have Christ. If you're here this morning, you've never personally made that choice. Jesus Christ at Calvary received your sin. The punishment, the payment for your sin in the experience of the cross. So that you and the experience the Bible calls salvation can receive his life. Not just forgiveness, that's wonderful. But life. 
Because your problem is not just that you're a sinner. Your problem is you're dead in sins and trespasses. And the second death, the death of your soul, is a lake of fire that burns with the lake of fire that burns with fire and brimstone for eternity. Separated from God, receiving the just wages of your sin. If there were no other reason to know there's a God, is to know that justice needs to prevail. You look around you in this world and you see so often justice falling in the street. And if there's no God, you ought to do what Darwin said. You ought to get out here with natural selection and let it be the survival of the fittest and see how it works out for you. Because as strong as you are and as hard as you strut, there'll come a time when someone else steps just a little faster, a little stronger, a little wiser, and they take you out. But if that's all there is, eat, drink, and be merry for tomorrow, you're fish bait. But you know in your heart that isn't the case. Because God put a knowledge down in the heart of every person about his eternal power and his Godhead. And when your soul cries out for justice, only God can produce that. And when your soul cries out for mercy, only God's grace can provide that. And oh, listen, he's done it abundantly in his son. Trust him. And God will make it all real to you. For those of you that have trusted him, for those of us that are saved, remember, that's who we are in him. And that he's the issue. And it's not our job just to go out now and show God what a, how smart he was by choosing us. <laughs> it's our job just to relax and be the, the new creature that he made us in Christ. And let that life go out in the world around us and demonstrate what real life is all about. That it's not in the things of the flesh. That it's not in the things of the world, but that it's in God's truth. You can't have Christ's blessings for operating in your life unless you have Christ. That goes for the lost person. You've got to trust him. It goes for the believer too because it has to be Christ in you, the hope of glory. Isn't it wonderful that it is Christ and that he is sufficient? So have a happy resurrection life, will you? Our Father, we thank you this morning for life in Christ Jesus. And Father, I thank you that it's more than just things to do, people to meet, places to go. It's life. We give you the praise for it in Christ's name. Amen.